Dave moved to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory last week, he tells me. <laughs> and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is in Pasadena, uh, California. He's a senior scientist uh, there. He's, um, uh, he's an expert in the global carbon cycle. He's an expert in ecology. Um, he has co-edited uh, The Carbon Cycle, which is a book published in 1997. He's authored uh, the Theory and Application of Tracers, published in 1993, and he has written a primer for the Princeton University Press called Climate and Ecosystems, which is hot in the presses. Not quite off the presses yet, but it's... Uh, so, uh, Dave. The, the book that I'm going to... Um, present, I suppose, highlights or, or best of, deals with the interaction of, of climate and ecosystems. And it, it addresses, in, in some sense, both the role of climate uh, in controlling the biological world in which we live and that we're a part of, and also uh, discusses some of the ways in which the biological aspects of the Earth's climate system influence uh, climate, much as Jeff has discussed how the ocean influences climate. In, in order to think about uh, the, the climate system, uh, about 20 years ago, people started talking actually about the Earth system because we, we came to understand that there were many controls over the climate that we experience on the planet that originated in, in other spheres, in the biosphere, in the cryosphere, um, and in the hydrosphere. And so I'm going to be talking about the interactions of the climate system, which we'll hear a lot more about, the physics of the climate system, in, in terms of its interactions with the terrestrial biosphere through the exchange of energy and moisture, uh, the, the role of terrestrial and marine ecosystems in influencing atmospheric composition, and how all of these processes influence both the evolution over time of life on the planet and the climate system. And I, I suspect that you'll see something like this many times today. Uh, the, the, the surface energy balance of the planet is influenced by the absorption and reflection of, of visible and infrared radiation captured by, the, by this equation. And it turns out that this is an excellent place to start thinking about how the biosphere and the atmosphere interact with each other. The biosphere influences the concentration of greenhouse gases. It influences the reflectivity or albedo of the planetary surface. It influences the partitioning of energy absorbed by the planet between what we call sensible and, and latent heat. That is, it influences the partitioning of energy absorbed between the evaporation of water and the other pathways through which the planet returns energy to the atmosphere and ultimately to space. All of these interactions and processes over land are influenced by the biosphere very directly, uh, and in the oceans influenced uh, in a variety of, of interesting ways. We've, we're all talking about our books. One of the one of the uh, really challenging aspects of writing this book, most um, uh, global ecologists specialize either in the, in the land biosphere or the ocean. Yet, in terms of understanding the interaction of the biosphere and climate, it's really essential to consider both of them, not only because they both influence the composition of the atmosphere and the energy balance of the planet, but also because uh, CO2 exchanged uh, in either sphere influences atmospheric concentration, which then goes on to have consequences in the other sphere. So they're tied together very directly, and in fact, when you're trying to interpret long records of carbon and climate, as Dave Archer will speak about later, it's very difficult yet essential to untangle the interacting effects of the land and the oceans. What, what are some of the drivers of, of modern change? Uh, 
This is a, f a recent figure. It was published in, in Nature magazine not long ago. And it looks at the velocity of climate change, the rate at which temperature is changing from the point of view of an organism. So what this shows is the rate at which a particular organism would have to migrate, or a particular species would have to migrate in order to keep the center of its geographic range at the same average temperature that it is today. So this is how fast plants that live, for example, only in the north or only in the south, would have to migrate in order to maintain their same relationship between their spatial, their geographic distribution and the climate. The interesting thing about this, the global average for this rate is about a kilometer per year. That's an interesting number because over the last 10,000 years, that is about as fast as species have ever migrated. So most of the world is projected to warm at a rate somewhere around the, the rate that will produce mi migration of species or movement of species ranges at rates that are as high as have ever been observed. And that will have to occur against the background of increasing disruption of movement corridors by urbanization and agriculture and other uh, human challenges to biology. A substantial fraction of the world will require species to move at 10 times that rate. So this is an extraordinary challenge to living systems. Now, even these areas where the rates appear to be low, if you'll notice, they're largely in mountainous areas. And these, although they don't involve the same degree of requirement for geographic movement over long distances, are very challenging because, as we know, the physical habitat, not just the climate, as you go up in elevation, changes. And this leads to concern with the phenomenon that, that uh, many uh, have spoken of, of species literally being pushed off the top of a mountain. That is, the habitat in which they exist, alpine tundra or high elevation forest, may no longer exist. Finally, from the point of view of biology, the other great uh, human experiment is, assen is essentially to fragment the biosphere by increasing rates of land use. This just shows the lower 48 of the US in terms of population change. You can see that many, most areas of the country are experiencing relatively high rates of population increase leading to more development. But even the areas that are showing decreases in population are experiencing land use change that's very uh, inimical to biology. That is, what's going on is the extensification of agriculture. More land being farmed by fewer people, leading to larger and larger farm units, less uh, uh, retention of natural habitat in the landscape, and a whole different series of challenges. One that's very well known is the destruction of prairie potholes in the northern Great Plains. Um, but the increase in the intensification of agriculture in the mid-continent is paradoxically as big a challenge for species movement as are many of the increases in population density in other areas. Finally, we're really throwing the biosphere of the planet into a blender and mixing it up. We're moving species around. These are maps of two particular invasive species. I'm a Westerner. These are the two species that I would say, in general, we hate the most. Tamarisk, which grows along water courses and destroys the camping. Cheatgrass, uh, which increases the risk of fire and gets in your socks. Um, it's also very bad for, uh, for livestock. If you go to the website uh, uh, of the US Department of Agriculture where these maps come from, you'll find maps like this for literally hundreds and hundreds of species that are introduced from Asia, from Africa, from Europe. And so we're changing the very biological composition, the, the, the very stuff of the biosphere. It's a little bit as if we replaced water vapor with, with uh, some other condensed liquid in the atmosphere. We'd have to change all of our equations. So climate shapes ecosystems. And one of the fundamental concepts
this is sort of ecology 101, is that of a species niche. If you look at, if you look at this upper panel, you can see very conceptually the, the range of two species in terms of this could be the range of temperature in which this species is viable. Below a certain temperature, it might not be able to live or reproduce. Above that temperature, it's happy. And if two species overlap, their ranges might be determined not only by their physical environment, but also by their interaction in the range in which they overlap. So from the distribution of species globally, we know a great deal about the climate sensitivity of those species, but because they also interact, they compete, or in some cases are symbiotic with each other, we don't know exactly what their climate limits are. Nonetheless, for the, for the tens of millions of species in the world, most of what we know about their relation to climate, in fact, comes from their geographic distribution. Uh, climate has many dimensions. Um, Jeff has talked about the latitudinal uh, and, and uh, planetary controls that are associated with the balance of land and ocean. Um, uh, in the land biosphere, elevation plays a major role by influencing uh, temperature in the vertical, influencing precipitation on uh, uh, rainy and rain shadow sides of mountain ranges. There's a somewhat inexact parallel to that in the ocean, where the attenuation of solar radiation influences the way the biosphere works. The, the uh, vertical transfer of organic matter influences the type of biosphere that's present at different depths, as does uh, the effects of temperature and pressure. On land, and there are analogies to this in the ocean, we can kind of capture in terms of latitude, uh, uh, humidity. This is in some sense a proxy for some combination of effects of mountains and effects of continentality. Again, Jeff showed an example between a continental and a maritime region. And, and elevation, we can classify and find repeated patterns over and over again across the planet of the type of ecosystem that exists in different climate regions. So for example, where it's wet at relatively low elevation in uh, tropical and subtropical latitudes, we tend to have subtropical and tropical rainforests. And again, there's mutual information here. Some of the early climate classifications were in fact based on observing vegetation. Some of the most powerful models that we have for how vegetation ecosystems may evolve in the future are based on these correlations. The very first one of those models was simply a computer program that reproduced uh, this diagram. That information disappears under conditions of rapid change. So again, this is one of these niche diagrams that shows the relationship between the distribution of a species and its range. And if that distribution, if the climate is stable, then that distribution is at steady state uh, with the climate. And one can either infer what the climate might be from the distribution of this organism, or one can infer the climate tolerance of that organism from its geographic correlation with climate. But if the climate is changing rapidly, that species cannot probably keep up with the rate of climate change. And so not only is that rough on the species, um, but it also means that there's no longer any information in the species distribution. It's simply at some arbitrary uh, lag behind its, its temperature tolerance. And so if you were to look at its distribution uh, in the Anthropocene in the modern period, um, it would no longer tell you that that species has a zero degree minimum tolerance. It would just tell you that it's moved somewhere from its previous range and we don't know where its future range might stabilize. Ecosystems, so ecosystems are influenced in many, in many ways in a dominant sense by climate, um, but they also influence the climate. 
Uh, I'm going to show a figure that maybe every single speaker will show. This is the Keeling curve. And as Jeff pointed out, um, it shows very directly the influence of biology on the planet. The seasonal cycle of CO2 in the atmosphere is dominated by the photosynthesis of land plants, mainly in the northern hemisphere where most of the land exists, and in the wintertime by the decay of that vegetation. And that produces this pattern that we refer, refer to as the breathing of the earth. But if you look at this curve, although it's remarkably constant and parallel to the emission of fossil fuels, it has a number of little bumps, plateaus, uh, and periods of acceleration. And much of that variability, which we can capture in this diagram, much of that variability is in fact due to the interaction of the physical climate system, largely the El Nino cycle, which dominates temperature variability and drought uh, at a planetary scale, um, and the biosphere. So for example, you can see um, the, the two El Nino periods that Jeff mentioned, two very strong El Nino periods, are both accompanied by jumps in the growth rate of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we believe that those jumps in the growth rate are due to either release or reduced uptake of carbon by the biosphere during El Nino uh, periods, both as a result of high temperature and drought in the tropics. And in fact, some significant portion of this variability in certain years is in associated actually with wildfires in the tropic driven by drought. The balance of it is driven, we think, by the influence of temperature on photosynthesis and respiration. And this has analogies on longer time scales um, that, that David will talk about in his presentation. Now, much of this coupling of the climate system and the biosphere occurs at the very tiniest of scales. And I want to I wanna mention this wonderful uh, construct, the stomate. This is the pore in the leaf of a plant. Uh, these are microscopic. They're not visible to the naked eye. The plant exchanges CO2 and water. It trades water for carbon through these tiny pores. The aperture of the pore is controlled by the plant. It opens wide to photosynthesize at high rates to allow CO2 freely into the substomodal cavity. It closes up tight to conserve water. And you can think of this as a sort of an optimization of the control of leaf temperature versus the growth rate of the plant. And by influencing the relative uh, release of water vapor to the atmosphere, the plant also controls the partitioning between the convective and radiant and the evaporative exchange of energy at the land surface. So these little tiny things, billions and billions and billions and billions of them, are one of the main ways in which the climate, the carbon cycle, and the water cycle, and ultimately, the planet's climate come together. The modern carbon budget, I won't dwell on this, um, but if we look at the land biosphere, we see a direct uptake of carbon responding to the history of human land use, the atmospheric CO2 concentration, uh, the integrated effects of climate change, leading to a very significant subsidy. About a quarter of the CO2 released from fossil fuel burning is taken back up by the land biosphere. Now this is kind of paying back a loan, or the opposite of that, because the main reason for the uptake of carbon by the modern land biosphere is the recovery of carbon into forests that were harvested before fossil fuel was the main energy source, during the early industrial period when wood was the, uh, was the primary fuel. In a similar way, the oceans take up about a quarter of fossil fuel emissions, again, providing, if you will, a subsidy to, to, to human society uh, for the climate system. There are other fascinating feedbacks uh, between the biosphere um, and the atmosphere. This is one uh, that is a hypothesis. It's existed as a hypothesis that uh, has been um, uh, addressed by literally thousands of inconclusive investigations, suggesting that there could be feedbacks through the aerosol cycle over the oceans. 
uh, phytoplankton, tiny plants in the ocean, produce dimethyl sulfide, uh, an important compound for essentially protection uh, from, from sunlight, that ultimately leads to the precursors of aerosols in the marine environment. And the hypothesis is that as energy flux to the ocean changes, this biological, physical, chemical cycle will respond in such a way that it ameliorates those changes in the ocean climate. Uh, this is just an example of many of these sorts of interactions and feedbacks um, that are reviewed in my book and referred to in some of the others that illustrate some of the complexity of the feedbacks and interactions. This one, even if it is not a fully stabilizing feedback, um, is based on a set of processes that surely influence the maritime climate. Modeling the future. Uh, one of the uh, great realizations of the past 20 years or so are that the uh, co-evolution of climate and ecosystems over decades and centuries is going to influence how the climate changes. The carbon cycle is one uh, primary example of that, but as I indicated with the dimethyl sulfide example, there are many other of these mechanisms, including physical feedbacks at the land surface through the energy balance and albedo. Um, the scientific community has attempted to capture these interactions by adding vegetation and soils, marine ecosystems, and atmospheric composition and chemistry to models of the Earth system. So we've expanded climate models indicated in this paler color to become what we refer to as, as Earth system models by incorporating these biological and chemical mechanisms. And these models are complicated and highly uncertain, um, but they're very interesting. They have fascinating behavior. For the biosphere, they really encompass this set of feedbacks, where water and energy availability drive uh, the uptake of carbon photosynthesis by land and ocean plants. Uh, on land, water is also a critical resource for plant growth, allowing them to regulate their temperature, transport nutrients within their Within their, uh, within their bodies. This living plant biomass dies and is ultimately returned to the atmosphere as CO2. Many uh, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and metals are also involved in metabolism and required. Um, for some of those nutrients, especially nitrogen, its uptake into the biosphere is also controlled by water and energy. And increasingly, we have models that try to capture these dynamics um, in ways that will allow us to model the future. Uh, the outcome of this modeling activity um, is fascinating and generates a good deal of employment security. Um, but uh, wonderfully, when these processes were incorporated into these Earth system models, they roughly doubled the uncertainty of the projection of climate for any given emission of CO2 that we assume for fossil fuels. So if you look at, the, at these, uh, we're showing here the uh, range of future carbon fluxes uh, on, just on land, the oceans add to this, that are simulated by contemporary Earth system models. And if we overlay that range on the uncertainty from those same models, uh, just showing the if effects of physical uncertainty, it roughly doubles the uncertainty because of the added complexity of predicting the carbon concentration of the atmosphere in the future. Again, these processes are very tightly coupled. Land and ocean fluxes depend really remarkably sensitively on the climate. David. The units on the top of that are gigatons a year, maybe? The units on the top are gigatons a year, and somehow they disappeared from the graphic. The units on the bottom are temperature. So I just want to conclude um, by uh, going back to the energy balance. Ultimately, ecosystems in the atmosphere, uh, ecosystems in, on land and the ocean, interact with the climate system by influencing the planetary energy balance, by influencing its reflectivity at the surface, by influencing the partitioning of energy,
between sensible and latent fluxes and by influencing the composition of the atmosphere and its radiative balance, both through what we refer to as greenhouse gases that warm the planet and by influencing aerosols in the atmosphere that may either warm or cool the atmosphere uh, depending on their properties and their location in the atmosphere. And so I think that if you visit atmospheric science or earth science departments around the country now, you'll find that many of them have people who are trained as biologists. Or you'll find that many of the people trained as physicists have learned an extraordinary amount uh, of biology. And I think that it's in that spirit that, that really the entire series is written. But particularly this book is, is written uh, reflective of my own career. Uh, I was trained as a atmosphere-biosphere interaction scientist with advisors from both meteorology, Dave Randall's department, and natural resources. And I think that this has become, has gone from being kind of a very weird and risky thing to do uh, to actually being a very, a very common and, and, and important scientific career. Thank you very much.